Now I am become death. The destroyer of worlds. The 2023 film Oppenheimer gave us one of the most remarkable and memorable movies of the entire year, but because it's based on historical events, let's find out just how accurate Christopher Nolan's film really is. And the answer, in short, is that it's very accurate. Nolan really did his homework when making this biopic about the father of the atomic bomb. Before we get to some of the mistakes made in the film and differences between what happened in real life versus the movie, here is your official spoiler warning. If you don't want the movie spoiled, come back after you've watched it, preferably in IMAX. Just trust me, it's worth it. Now, while the film got almost every aspect of J. Robert Oppenheimer's life and of the Manhattan Project right, there were a few mistakes and changes made to better suit the spectacle of the big screen over the history books. Let's start with the doctor's early life as he studied under a tutor named Patrick Blackett. Oppenheimer at the time was very unhappy in his life. He struggled with his lab work, regularly making mistakes, and grappling with depressive thoughts. It was in this state that, after some sort of argument with his mentor, Oppenheimer used a toxic chemical to poison an apple on Blackett's desk. The film showed us that he did this because Blackett made Oppenheimer late to a lecture by Niels Bohr, but the real reason and the real type of poison he used is unknown to this day. But he really did try to poison his teacher. Instead of hastily running to stop Niels Bohr from accidentally eating it the next day as shown in the film, However, the university found out about the attempted poisoning and Oppenheimer was almost expelled. Since no one ate the apple though, and because Oppenheimer's parents were wealthy benefactors of the school, they were able to convince the headmaster to allow Oppenheimer to stay. Later, Oppenheimer moved to study under Max Born, where he was able to thrive and publish many papers expanding on the work of Dr. Werner Heisenberg. Heisenberg and Oppenheimer were friends, as shown in the film, before eventually becoming rivals in the creation of the atomic bomb, with Heisenberg working for Germany and Oppenheimer working for the United States. In the film, it's shown that Oppenheimer learned Dutch in just six Six weeks in order to give a lecture. This actually is true. Oppenheimer was very gifted in learning several languages, and he really did learn how to speak Dutch to give a lecture, saying, I don't think it was very good Dutch, but it was appreciated. In the film, Oppenheimer is shown to meet a married woman named Kitty, with whom he eventually married himself. This is also true, as Kitty was married before getting pregnant with Oppenheimer, and later divorced her husband so she could marry the father of her child. Also, just as the film showed, Oppenheimer and Kitty gave their son to a friend to be raised for the summer, as they went through a difficult personal time. Powerful moments like these are what really drives the emotion throughout the film, even though they may not be essential to telling the story of the creation of the atomic bomb. In the film, we see Luis Alvarez running from a barber shop after reading about some scientists who had successfully split an atom of uranium by bombarding it with neutrons. He ran to find Oppenheimer, who would attempt to prove that this was impossible by writing out the math on his blackboard. This actually happened in real life, and Alvarez successfully repeated the process the next day, proving that a nuclear bomb could be possible and reaffirming, as the movie says multiple times, that theory only goes so far. The the film shows several scenes of Oppenheimer and Einstein together as friends, which is also accurate. The two became friends after they met at Caltech and remained in touch throughout the creation of the atomic bomb, although Einstein was not nearly as involved in the project as Oppenheimer. The film also accurately portrayed the fact that Albert Einstein wrote a letter to President Roosevelt stating that a massive bomb could now be made through nuclear fission, and that Germany would likely be able to build one themselves. Oppenheimer was bad at math, but good with people and one man saw him as a true genius. Lieutenant Leslie Groves, the man in charge of putting together the team that would build an atomic bomb for the United States. Groves chose Oppenheimer to head the Manhattan Project's secret weapons laboratory, meaning he would be in charge of building the first atomic bomb for the United States of America. Even though he had several links to the Communist Party, Groves chose Oppenheimer because he believed that he was one of the smartest men alive. One thing the film didn't really portray, however, is that Oppenheimer had never held a position of leadership before. He also hadn't received any Nobel Prizes as some of his colleagues had before, so he really wasn't the most qualified person for the job. A quote from both the film and from his real life writings, Oppenheimer once said, My two great loves are physics and New Mexico. It's a pity they can't be combined. The physicist truly loved the desert landscape of New Mexico as he spent time there in his youth and even had a ranch there. It also provided a great location for secrecy and for setting off a large nuclear blast. The best remote and flat location the Manhattan Project team could find was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, known to the outside world only as P.O. Box 1663. While some of the events in Los Alamos were dramatized in the film, Nolan once again stayed very true to the real events that inspired the film. Christopher Nolan wanted to make that Los Alamos site as historically accurate as possible, so he used archival footage of the real site to rebuild it for the film. That's right. He had the entire site rebuilt, totaling 54 buildings, including a sawmill, stables, schools, apartments, 
laboratories, hospitals, garages, special cottages for the project leads, and maybe most importantly, labor and delivery buildings. During the time of the Manhattan Project, over one-fifth of the married women at the site got pregnant, and over 300 babies were born, with their birth certificates listing their place of birth as P.O. Box 1663 in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oppenheimer originally thought he would need anywhere from 6 to 50 scientists and some additional support staff to make the bomb. However, the Manhattan Project ended up employing and involving 764 scientists and over 600,000 additional civilians and military personnel. But before we get to how the bomb was made really quick, this video is brought to you by Skillshare. Have you ever wanted to know how huge scale cinematic movies like Oppenheimer get made? Well, Skillshare is the place for you. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of online classes and members focused on a learn by doing approach to teaching, which works really well for me. Skillshare has classes on animation, marketing, productivity, graphic design, and even CGI. But I'm most excited about Zach Mulligan's class on cinematography basics, because as you probably know, I love movies and almost all of my favorite movies have excellent cinematography, including several of Christopher Nolan's films, such as The Dark Knight, Inception, Interstellar, and even Oppenheimer. So if you start to notice my videos getting a lot more cinematic, well, it's because of Skillshare. Skillshare has a special offer for all of you, and the first 1,000 people that join Skillshare using my link will get one month of Skillshare for free. Okay, so let's say you only do Skillshare for an hour a day. That's over 30 hours of classes you'll be getting for completely free. And no, there's not a catch. It's actually 100% free for the first month. So if any of this interests you, I highly recommend that you click my link down below, sign up to Skillshare, and start learning something new. Okay, now back to the video. Nolan's film did a great job of portraying how the first atomic bomb was built, but didn't do the best job of specifying how long it took and how many people were involved. In all, it took over two years to construct the bomb, and it was proven to be possible in 1942 with the successful construction of the first nuclear reactor, otherwise known as Pile 1. This reactor was built by Enrico Fermi, and just as the movie showed, it was housed underneath the football field at the University of Chicago. This reactor's construction proved that a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction was possible, so a nuclear bomb would also be possible. The Manhattan Project team eventually settled on an implosion bomb design, which would involve surrounding a core of plutonium with explosives that would increase the density of atoms in the plutonium, creating a chain reaction resulting in a nuclear blast equal to thousands of tons of TNT. As shown in the film, the bomb needed to be tested before the Potsdam Conference where the post-World War II peace talks would take place. So, two days before the conference, the test firing of the explosives for the implosion device was a failure. Even though this test failed, they decided to move forward with the atomic weapon test, now known as Trinity, on the next morning, July 16th, 1945. Although there's no account of the conversation between Oppenheimer and the bomb technician who bet his month's salary that the final weapon test would work. The film also shows us how at one point, Edward Teller, who went on to invent the hydrogen bomb, had worries that the nuclear weapon may start a great enough chain reaction that it would heat up the hydrogen in the atmosphere, causing it to fuse together and become a giant fusion bomb, setting the atmosphere on fire. After some initial calculations, however, almost every scientists involved in the project dismissed the concern, realizing that the chances of this happening was, as the film stated, near zero. But it wasn't Albert Einstein who Oppenheimer visited to confirm this. Einstein wouldn't have been any good for that anyway, as he specialized in other kinds of science. Instead, Oppenheimer consulted Arthur Compton, who confirmed there was a near-zero possibility of such a catastrophe happening. But Enrico Fermi really did take bets on Teller's theory before the Trinity test, as shown in the film. On the morning of July 16, 1945, the day before the Potsdam Conference, Los Alamos, New Mexico began to see rain clouds and heavy winds. This weather would push back the time of the atomic weapons detonation to 5.29 AM, which would produce an explosion equal to 25,000 tons of TNT. The shockwave from the blast would be felt from over 160 kilometers away, and it produced a mushroom cloud that would reach 12 kilometers high. The film doesn't zoom out beyond the scientists and military members who watched the Trinity test at various distances, but the brightness of the flame, the sound of the explosion, and the shaking caused by the blast wave didn't go unnoticed. The force blew out windows in nearby cities, including Amarillo, Texas, over 280 miles away, where residents could see the flash from their doorsteps. Because of this, the government planted a story that an ammunition magazine had exploded, but that no one was hurt, so as to maintain the project's secrecy. One somewhat funny moment from the test in the film included physicist Richard Feynman getting into a truck to watch the atomic bomb test from behind a windshield because he said it would protect him from the ultraviolet radiation, and this actually happened. I'm probably the only guy who saw it with a human eye, he said, as everyone else watched through dark glasses. Although many people have joked online that Christopher Nolan used a real nuclear bomb for the detonation sequence, he actually used a mixture of practical explosions, chemical reactions, and CGI to generate the images we saw in the film. Also, the movie failed to show a rather interesting result of the explosion, Trinitite. 
The explosion was so hot that it turned the desert sand into a glass-like material now known as trinitite, named after the bomb test's name, Trinity. Selecting the targets for the atomic bombs was a complicated process that involved many people, including Oppenheimer and Secretary of War Henry Stimson. Stimson, however, gets turned into a sort of caricature in the movie, stating that they wouldn't bomb Kyoto because he and his wife honeymooned there. Although he and his wife did visit Kyoto in real life, they didn't take their honeymoon there and it wasn't the reason why Kyoto wasn't chosen. The decision was more nuanced and complicated and had far-reaching consequences for the cities that were bombed. On August 6th and 9th, 1945, the United States detonated two atomic bombs over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. The aerial bombings together killed between 129,000 and 226,000 people, most of whom were civilians, and remained the only use of nuclear weapons in an armed conflict. The film depicts the use of these bombs as absolutely necessary to ensure the surrender of the Japanese people, but many historians argue this wasn't the case, and that Japan was likely to surrender even without the use of nuclear weapons. After the detonation of the two bombs over Japan, Oppenheimer became a national hero, even appearing on the cover of Time magazine. He was placed on the General Advisory Committee for Nuclear Weapons, on which he vehemently argued for arms control. When he was asked about when the arms control talk should have begun with Russia, Oppenheimer said, the day after the Trinity test. He had created a way for humanity to destroy itself. And in a 1965 NBC News documentary, Oppenheimer recalled a quote from the Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, saying, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. He said that the verse came into his mind as he watched the test, which had unfolded two decades earlier and marked the first detonation of a nuclear device. The biggest departure from reality in the entire film stems from this important quote. Instead of stating this quote in an NBC documentary, Oppenheimer says this in the film during an intimate scene with Florence Pugh's character, Jean Tatlock. Not only is this moment in the film entirely fictional, but it's drawn condemnation from the Indian government. In a letter addressed to Christopher Nolan on Twitter, India's information commissioner Uday Mahurkar called the scene featuring the revered scriptures a scathing attack on Hinduism and a direct assault on the religious beliefs of a billion tolerant Hindus. He urged Nolan to remove the scene from the film, but it remained in the film as he intended. Later in his life, Oppenheimer was essentially put on trial for his security clearance because he used his status to push for arms control. Louis Strauss, played by Robert Downey Jr., who looks a lot like Strauss in real life, pushed for the hearing on Oppenheimer's security clearance and interfered in the hearing because Oppenheimer had humiliated Strauss about isotopes at an earlier conference. The hearings found several reasons as to why Oppenheimer's security clearance would eventually be revoked, with the main one being his ties to the Communist Party. Oppenheimer had engaged in an affair with Jean Tatlock, a Communist Party member who later killed herself, and he even met with her at least one time during the Manhattan Project, which raised many security concerns. His wife was also a former Communist Party member, so he was accused of potential treason and espionage. It was later confirmed that there were actually Russian spies on the Manhattan Project, as seen in the film. In 1953, Oppenheimer once again made the cover of Time magazine, but this time in black and white, as his security clearance had been revoked and his image had been tarnished. During the construction of the bomb, Oppenheimer knew the weapon would likely need to be used, but he felt that Hiroshima and Nagasaki weren't necessary. As shown in the film, Oppenheimer met with President Truman, with whom he asked to begin arms control talks, and just as in the film, Oppenheimer said he felt he had blood on his hands. Truman, however, countered, saying that the blood was actually on his hands, even going so far as to call Oppenheimer a crybaby scientist, and kicked him out of the Oval Office. The film failed to show, however, that Truman would later honor Oppenheimer with a presidential citation and a medal for merit in 1946. Also, as one fun final detail the film got correct, one of the senators who voted against the confirmation of Strauss into the president's cabinet was Senator John F. Kennedy, future president of the United States. All in all, Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer may be one of the most historically accurate biopics to hit the big screen in a long time, and his attention to detail will surely pay off. Subscribe for more content about your favorite movies, and if you liked the video, check out the one on your screen too.